Um, I'll, I'll have to say this is, um, I have been a huge fan of your historical fiction. Uh, Circling the Sun is a huge favorite of mine. I still think about that book quite Thank a bit. You. Yes. Uh, so when I heard that you were writing a literary mystery, which is my all-time favorite genre, I could not wait to crack it open. And I picked it up and literally um, my family could tell you this is how I looked for an entire day. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually doing laundry. I was you know, doing never put, I read it in one day and just... <laughs> I hugged it when I was done. I, I just absolutely loved it. It's such a special book. So um, my favorite of the year, it's still Thank up here. You. It hasn't been knocked off yet. Um, and I doubt it will. So, um, well, if it does just know, I do not need to know that moment, but <laughs> I love that before we move on, I just love that you said that about hugging a book when you're done, which is how I handle books. You know, like when you love something, it's almost like you need for this object to know, right? Like I pet it, I turn it over in my hand. Thank you. And thank just you. really need to say thank you because reading at its best is an immersive experience. We wanna be taken on an emotional journey. And I just, you know, no other medium kind of does that in exactly the same way. Like you said, you read it in a day, you just sort of fell into that entire world. You can go to the movies for two hours. You can do Netflix, even if you're binging, but it's not the same. Nobody wants to hug and pet, you know, like an episode of Netflix. It's a completely <laughs> unique experience and just God bless books and bookstores and book lovers, you know? And authors. And authors, well, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Authors make us go around for sure. Yeah. Well, I read Paris Wife as well as Elizabeth. And I, I was telling Elizabeth, I was like, I really feel like Paula sealed the deal. I will never like Ernest Hemingway because. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone, Allison. I, I just, I was like, that's it. It's enough. I don't care how great he is. He was terrible. <laughs> but I, de I love that so much. And um, we talked a lot about how you've done these historical fictions and now this big switch to literary, like mystery thriller. Um, can you describe kind of the origin of the story, like how, where it came from? Yeah, so this book, When the Stars Go Dark, was just a total left field book for me, which happens sometimes. So it happens when I wrote The Paris Wife, this idea came from nowhere. And I learned to follow those ideas that come from nowhere. Liz Gilbert would say it's big magic, right? The ideas, generative ideas are floating around like molecules in the universe. And they sort of bonk into us every once in a while. And it kind of feels like that. I was on a super long dog walk, about four mile dog walk. And by the time I came home, I just had this character in my mind, this Anna Hart detective character. I knew she was super troubled. I knew she was running from the weight of the past and running smack into the weight of the present, um, that those two things were gonna be connected. And I'd never even thought about writing this genre. And really to me, it's not about the genre, it's about the story. Like, what is this, what is this dictating? You know, what is the idea sort of calling out for? And then that's the thing that you need to kind of I don't know, get brave enough to throw yourself off a cliff for. It's almost like the, I, the idea itself seems to have an agenda, if that makes any sense. Like it has its own life and it needs to go somewhere. I always said when I got the idea for the Paris wife that it was like a rocket ship and that story was going. And all I had to do was like, hold on and not screw it up. And this one, kind of the same thing. I saw this detective, I saw this, victim, I saw how their lives were connected and I saw the town. So Mendocino where it's set is a place that's really important to me just personally as a young woman. And I just knew, I hadn't thought about it in years, but as soon as this idea came, it came attached to the place. And I just knew just everything about it, you know, the atmosphere and the, the place that nature has in the book and how the town becomes a character. And all of that seemed like really intact even before I got home from this dog walk. Of course, if only it could be so easy. It still took, you know, two and a half, almost three years to write it. 
Yeah. One of my, I, what I, one of the things I really loved about the story was reading and, and all of a sudden I read uh, the poly class story. And that oh. is something I remember so vividly. I was in college when that happened and little Polly looked like my little sister. And I just, oh, yeah. I, it, one of the, the scariest, most horrific stories start to finish I have ever, I, I just, it really impacted me. So when I saw that that was part of the story, uh, it drew me in even further. Um, yes. Did you, did you specifically choose the poly class story because of the time frame when that happened before DNA testing, before? Right, right. Um, is that the reason you picked that one or was it just what what was it about the polyclass story that drew you in so i can't speak for other novelists you know i have a lot of writer friends and we all seem to have our own process and and it's different person to person but i kind of never know what i'm doing i'm really intuitive and i just kind of plunge out in this really messy um heartfelt but uh disorganized way into this world. And like I said, I started with character. I started with a place. And once I have a voice, and maybe it's because I got my start as a poet, once I have the voice of the story, I just kind of plunge ahead and I don't really know where it's going. I had a writer friend who once said that writing a novel is like being a blind naked mole rat. Now I know that doesn't sound all that glamorous, but it does sort of feel like you're tunneling through the dark. So I wrote almost a whole draft, Elizabeth, before I realized that I did not want to write a book that had the internet in it <laughs> or laptops or DNA testing or any of these modern sort of modern criminology because we're way too facile and familiar with this world. Everyone watches the CSI thing. We're so exposed to this. And so the irreverent thing for me to do would be to take all of that away and just tell a straight story where people have to talk to each other, right? <laughs> um, and I just loved that idea. And I thought, okay, okay. So in the nineties, right? And I had to figure out like when the internet started and when all this started. And so 1993 was random. But this is what I love about the universe. It feels random. And yet once you start down that particular path, you realize that it's not random at all. So I chose the time period, 1993, and I'd already set the story late in the fall of that year. And I'd set it in 2016. I don't know, that was probably random too. And one day I was listening to a podcast, kind of trying to get the veracity of Anna's voice. She's a missing persons expert. Like she has to know her business, right? So I'm listening to this podcast and it just happens to be this retired FBI agent interviewing another retired FBI agent who was Eddie Fryer, who is the lead detective on the Polyclass case. And all of these interior bombs are going off when I think, oh my goodness, that's right. And you know, 93, like I remember that too, but I had put it to the side just as you had. And then it all came back in this powerful way. And I thought, I'm writing a story. These are imaginary characters. I have the freedom to make these details up. And yet real people do not have the freedom to escape mm -hmm. the reality when tragedy strikes. And so I just thought my victim, Cameron Curtis, is a contemporary of Polly Kloss, even though one is imaginary and one is real in that realm of trauma, right? And violence against women, they're contemporaries. And I just decided to include her story in the novel. And once I did, everything really kind of fell into place and opened almost kaleidoscopically, which is what happens when we know we're onto something. And it's so funny, you know, now that I think about it, y'all, I have spent a decade like surfing that line between fact and fiction, mm -hmm. but it was right in front of me. I didn't see the possibilities in the story until I sort of found that, that historical fact laying right in the middle, right, right in the middle of the path. One of my uh, favorite authors, Kate Morton, talks about how she likes to write her stories before the 90s because there was more mystery involved. 
Mm. Because there wasn't the internet where you could just solve every problem and look it up and whatever. And and she's just saying it's just it's it's an easier uh, setting to like bring in all of these like mystery and, and characters that don't know what is happening. And so it leads the reader on a path. I thought that was so interesting. So when it was set in the nineties, I to me I was remembering what she said. Yeah. About how Anna was on her own journey to find all these things out. Yeah, 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 yeah. So really it was a lazy decision on my part, which turned into, I like Kate's version better. Um, it is more interesting. And now, you know, on these CSI shows, and I watch them too, I, and they're and they're very pleasurable. It's satisfying to see people, you know, sort of like, oh, my laptop here says blah, 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 this blood's better pattern. Or, and you're like, yes, that's it. But they're never wrong because the computer is never wrong, but people are wrong. Mm -hmm. And a novel is about flawed characters finding their way because that's what life is about, right? Flawed people finding their way. And if we're going to identify with characters, they have to get stuff wrong. And Anna has to get in her own way. And she has to be wrestling with her demons. I mean, because that's what, that's what books do, right? So true. Well, on that note, um, I was listening to an interview you did on a podcast and you, it was so interesting hearing your background and it, that this book is really personal to you. Yeah. Um, would you talk more about that, about foster care and- Yeah, 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 yeah. And just a little bit of a trigger warning in case, you know, talking about this stuff makes you upset. I mean, it, you know, I lived it. So I can sometimes be a little flip when I discuss the, the past. It's almost like a made for TV movie that happened to somebody else. But um, my sisters and I, I have an older sister and a younger sister, and we grew up in foster care in California in the 1970s and 80s. So I was four years old. And all of us were under six when my mom left in 1970. Um, and she took us to our grandmother's house and said she was going to the movies, and she never came back. So we entered a series of foster homes and I spent literally the rest of my um, youth in foster care. We were always together. People ask that question and it's actually very rare that we were always together. And even though we never talked about the things that were happening to us, just the physical fact of my sisters, I happen to know was a life-saving um, just element in my childhood. But the trauma that happened to us, not just the trauma of abandonment or repetitive abandonment, right? And loss and uncertainty and, and that, as we know, can completely um, fundamentally sort of shape a psyche. But then of course there was, not of course, but there was, there was violence and abuse in, in these homes. And particularly when I was uh, four, five, five and six years old, there was sexual abuse in a home. Um, and, you know, that has lodged, of course, itself into my being. And I've built a life sort of in response to that, which is how not to be a victim, right? How to take back my own power, how to have a voice, like all of those things. But as humans, we wrestle with these things. And then children, of course, children wrestle with these things, right? Do, do they have a voice? Do they have the power to say no? Can they act on their own behalf? Who can they trust when the grownups in charge can't be trusted? You know, those questions. So all of that stuff is at the center of me. Did I think on that dog walk that I was gonna unlock this whole Pandora's box of the past? Absolutely not. I think I would have run screaming in the other direction, but this is what happens as you kind of do the blind, naked, mole rat dance into the dark of a novel is that stuff comes up. And when I started to work on Anna's backstory, the stories just naturally fell to me. I thought, here's the first time in a decade that I have a chance to write about a fictional character. And suddenly, she's got my baggage, you know, <laughs> like maybe my therapist would have some things to say about that, but it just made sense to me suddenly, like I could give her all of my fascinations, my obsessions, my fixations, the stuff that I'm interested in and the stuff that I want to solve as a human, because sister, I believe that we are here to heal, mm -hmm. right? And so why not set my character up to be on that same journey? And then what does she need to do to get there? 
and how can I help her get there? That's so great. I imagine that that whole process, besides writing a book that people love, that you're writing about the such personal aspects of yourself, it has to be both hard and therapeutic. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I, I think it's um, part of my, you know, books can do more than one thing. You can tell a good story, a page turning story, you can entertain. You can even have a book that like cares about the language. You can write beautiful sentences and then it could have this whole other objective, which to me feels more social, right? You can write a feminist novel that doesn't feel like a feminist novel, like The Paris Wife, right? Just wrap it in a killer love story that makes everybody cry on airplanes, um, right? And then I think in this book, I just set out to tell a story that people don't like to tell very often, not even to their closest and maybe especially not to their closest. Like what would happen instead of burying? Because silence is disempowering, right? So instead of burying the things that we're afraid to talk about or ashamed to talk about. If we tell one person, if we tell our sister, or we tell our best friend, or we tell our children or whatever, it releases the hold that the shame has on our stories and suddenly somebody could be listening. So if I get brave enough to write a novel about sexual assault and victimhood and how to find power and somebody reads it and says, oh my God, that's my story. And maybe reading that story helps them tell one person and the person they tell says, oh my God, that's my story. And they tell, see what I mean? It releases all of that silence. So that's, I uh, just was very impacted by your article in the New York Times. Mm. Uh, can you, Thank can you. you kind of d discuss that a little bit for people who've not read that yet? Um, what was it like to be so vulnerable and to share something so <laughs> terrifying? It was yeah. terrifying to be vulnerable. And yet, again, I chose to do it. Like we get to make these choices, right? We have the facts of our lives and we choose what to do with them. And um, and you may discuss that. I don't know if everyone has read that. Yeah, yeah, I'm fixing to. Um, yes. That's my favorite word, by the way. I lived in the South for a while and I'm, it's, I'm fixing to tell a story and it's fixing to ring. I mean, it's it's a very useful word. Um, Southerners. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, essay that Elizabeth is talking about was in the New York Times Modern Love column. And the title, what, which I did, didn't title it, the editor of Modern Love did, and it said something like, I took a vow of celibacy, which is kind of a um, provocative and definitely gets your attention. And the uh, even though I was horrified to read that title, the gist of the piece is really about making a decision at a certain point to go back through all of my romantic relationships and to and to understand how they're tethered to my developmental trauma. And at a certain point after you have so many relationships and it starts to feel like you're repeating the same story over and over again because you haven't worked out your business. And so it started to feel like that. And I just thought, you know, until I am able to tell a new story or wrestle with some other octopus, like maybe I'm gonna put this down for a while. And oh my God, I got more responses to that essay than any piece of writing I've ever done just thousands of letters, you know, saying me too, you know, saying this is my story as well, saying, you know, nobody really talks about how romantic relationships are a working out of this childhood stuff, but how could they not be, right? We think we've moved on or we think we should have moved on, right? And you hear people say it all the time. Oh, I'm just going to let that go. Why can't you just let that go? That happened so long ago. Like how the thing is, we can't let things go until we let them in, until right. we fully accept all of these parts of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. I know this is turning into an episode of like Oprah's Super Soul Sunday, um, but that's okay. I think I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready to be on Oprah and I'm ready to answer these questions. So. Well, we're happy to play Oprah for you. Oh, thank you. 
Um, for everyone can I go else. to Maui though? Can I go to Maui? Yes. Isn't that where her farm is? Doesn't it? Yes, we'll go somewhere beautiful. Okay, so that'd be lovely. Upstairs. That'd be awesome. Um, for everyone that hasn't read the article, I did post the link in the chat. So if you want to just save that and read it later, awesome. it was really beautiful piece okay. of writing. Um, so I felt, I was telling Elizabeth when we were discussing, I, there were times when reading this book, I forgot it was fiction because I was learning so much. Mm. And even in my mind, I was like, oh, I need, I, need, I need to investigate that part more. Or I was saving quotes of things I wanted to think about, about, especially about victims. Mm. Um, so Anna is fascinated with victims and her, their stories. And, um, I wanted to hear, like, it's obvious that you've done tons of research in victim yeah. editors. Um, and there is, I, when I was listening to the podcast, you were talking about this, um, bat signal. Yep. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm going to have to sit with that for a while. And I was thinking about even like growing up when you would see or, or be a girl that just was uncomfortable in her skin and whatever. And you just felt that that girl needed someone to protect her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. First of all, I'll say one more thing about, about victims. You know, it's not just that I was one as a kid or that it's, I feel like it's really important to shine a light on this person, this particular aspect of our, of our experience as particularly as women. But, you know, I was reading all these books to do research for this novel because I, again, I wanted Anna to be really, really knowledgeable. And over and over again, as I was reading all these mind hunter books, essentially, like really peering into and unpeeling the psychotic mind and the, and the psychosocial mind and like all this crazy stuff. Like we're fascinated with predators. And I kept thinking in all of these books, the victim was this tiny little thumbnail sketch. And I'm like, well, what about their story? Who were these people? And how did they get to that particular moment? And maybe we need to go backwards, right? To see how these lives are intertwined. So that was just an idea that I had off to the side. And then I went to go, uh, I went on a, 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 it was actually a book club. It was a super fancy book club that took me to a spa in Tucson. And instead of giving me my fee, they gave me, you know, like $1,100 in spa services, wow. right? So instead of getting like a facial or like a seaweed wrap, I went to a healer because that's, um, you know, I was born and raised in California. That's what we do for fun, you know, and it was this trauma therapist that everybody was saying was so brilliant. And it turned out he was just absolutely extraordinary and he, you know, famous, in fact, he was there at 9-11. He, he's helped 100,000 trauma victims. He was there at the Oklahoma City bombing. It's like, he's really, this is his, this is his work, his life's work. And so I sat in his, you know, office and he took a little bit of my backstory. And at a certain point, I talked for maybe half an hour it was like the intake part, you know, the therapist does, and he's just stopped me right there. And he says, okay, okay. So here's the thing. Everyone comes into the world pure and whole and bright. And that light is the soul. And everybody gets the, that bright, completely untainted soul. But then for a certain percentage of people, one in four, one in seven, one in 10, trauma happens, loss, violence, abuse, neglect, dislocation, despair. And it's like black tar that covers that light. And when the soul shines through, it makes a bat signal. Now, this therapist was saying that to me about me. He was saying about the relationships that I've had, about different sets of parents, about different relationships that I was playing out. Not, I mean, not just romantic relationships, but you know what I mean? Over and over through time. And he says, that's, that's the bat signal. That's the thing that we need to clear in this life to totally heal because otherwise every narcissistic, alcoholic, you know, piece of shit loser is gonna come, right, running because they see this and recognize it. And I know that that's a tricky thing to say. And as you can see, I put it just right whole cloth into my book as a conversation. 
between these two detectives because I was so fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. right about what that means and just what you said Alice and we see these people right you always knew that girl right that girl in middle school or somebody who just was a little bit wounded and a little bit hurt and sort of that gets telegraphed almost like this very subtle kind of sign to others right and yeah and it's and it's complicated and of course it's never that victims fault for being wounded or hurt, right? Other people have hurt them. Other people hurt me. And I was just not even aware that I was putting out these um, signals, right? So interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So, true. so one of the things that I absolutely loved about this book is that it's got kind of a little bit of everything and, and I guess you know you kind of even said earlier there's no book is a monolith where it you know neatly fits into a genre but this one is I don't know super special because it has this gorgeous nature writing I mean you you are truly a talented poet your Thank your writing you. is gorgeous and I, I read a lot of books but there's something about a Paula McLean book that oh, just you. is very special to me thank you um, but you've got the nature writing you've got true crime you've got a little mystery a little thriller and my cat I don't my know kitty I know I heard yeah <laughs> my kitty <laughs> she wants to come in the room and she can't so um, yeah, sorry about that no worries but was that a conscious decision to uh, to kind of have several different genres in this one book. Um, what do you think about that? No, I don't think it's conscious at all. I think I just kind of let it all in. You know, like you can't, I don't know, you can't choose who you are, right? Your personality or all that stuff, but you can choose to let aspects of yourself shine, right? There are probably people who know certain facets of you, right? A friend might describe you differently from your husband or your children or what have you, right? But in this book, suddenly, like all of these facets seem to have space in this book, right? So you read Circling the Sun. I love that book. I really I love that did. book. Oh, Beryl Markham. She's such a badass. And my cat in. Oh, that's okay. You can let Kitty in. It's oh, fine. Yes. You thought it was going to be your dog, but it's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, it's your cat. Yeah, but now I get to see your fun skirt. That was, that was worth it. Oh, yes. 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 <laughs> That's adorable. Okay, we digressed. Please That's adorable. Going. No, that's fine. I was saying about circling the sun. That was because of the setting is, you know, colonial Africa. And suddenly it just really called to my imagination. I mean, so did Paris as a place, but there's something about the wild open expanses, just the natural world just calls to me. I mean, I, again, got my training as a poet, my superpower, I do two things. I can describe things and I can make pie. <laughs> That's beautiful. The two things, yeah, those are the two <laughs> things I know how to do really well. And so like the nature of writing just came really easily to me. That's where I go. You know, I believe in nature as medicine and I believe that nature can soothe our souls. And in this book in particular, I just understood that if I made Anna's foster father, somebody who had that in his wheelhouse, you know, for a while I made him uh, a sheriff and I thought, no, 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 no. He's a forest ranger because if he's a forest ranger, he has this entirely different toolkit. And when Anna comes to him completely wounded, she's 10 years old, she's had sort of all the same kinds of dislocation I had as a kid, way too many moves, right? Way too much uncertainty and loss. And she says at one point, Anna says in the book, which is straight out of my mouth, I had too many mothers and not enough mothering. So that's Anna's experience and Hap just kind of takes her exactly as she is and, and shows her how to build trust in herself and build trust in the world as a place that she can learn and know and that will hold her, you know? And it's this beautiful thing. She says at one point, Hap already knew how to talk to me, survivor to survivor. You know, he has all of these nature survival skills and she has had to learn how to survive like in a scrappy way. 
in the world. And I just love their relationship. I was asked in, an, in another interview, like, who is half? Like, who is this? Is this based on somebody you, you know? Was this, a, you know, based on a foster parent that you had at one point? And I can only say, I wish, you know, I wish I had had somebody that was really that anchoring and um, all accepting. And I just, you know, I gave her the kind of father or parent that I wish I had had as a kid. And that pretty much everybody deserves to have, you know? I yeah. love them. Yeah, thanks. Um, you mentioned before, or, or clarify something for me, when before you heard the polyclass case, you had already decided to set it in Mendoc Mendocino, is that right? Yeah, it was already set in Mendocino. It was already set in the seasons. I had about three-fourths of the book done, just kind of the down and dirty draft. Yeah, so I knew about the place. You know, so Petaluma, where Polly Kloss, you know, was abducted is 60 miles away. And my um, imaginary girl disappeared at the end of September and it was 10 days later that Polly Kloss disappeared. And again, like those kind of details just seem to have like an eerie shimmer, right? It wasn't just the year, it was within days, 60 miles apart. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, our store manager is from the same area and oh, so really? she was reading it. It was like, she knew the town Jenner. She was saying we used to drive through that to get there. So it was, it took on a yeah. whole experience for her too. And yeah. I, um, kept thinking how much there was such a sense of place in the book. Yeah. Um, like Elizabeth said like this book had everything <laughs> like, it had, like <laughs> and a psychic and a really great dog and Right. I mean, the dog was the cherry on top. Um, <laughs> did, did you, I mean, like, of course, the Paris wife setting was Paris 1920s. And I felt that when I read it. Is that something you bring to every book where the setting and it has to be a strong um, part of the book? I think so. I, had, I think so. Once I was doing a live event and somebody at the back stood up during the Q&A. And instead of saying, what are you going to write about next? She said, where are you going to take us next? And I thought that's kind of right. You know, different writers have different entrance points into their work and some writers really love dialogue or they see character or they see the story or they know the end and they write to the end. And for me, it's two things. It's the voice, right? Cause I usually write in the first person and it's the place. Like the place really seals the deal. And I think it's because as a reader I always wanted to put a book on like, you know, invisibility cloak and just fall into that world and completely disappear. And I could do that better when I could really imagine that world. Um, and it still works for me, almost like an actor's trick, right? I climb inside the world and see out the eyes of my character. And if I can't see it, then I can't help you see it, right? I we have to get there together. Yes, and I was Googling like images. So when um, you talked about the area and I cannot remember the name because it feels complicated, um, that where Cameron took her pictures. Oh, the Crumholtz Road. Did was, you see some of those trees? Those yes. crazy twisty trees? I know, really just I know. So that was part of my I spent time in Mendocino in my 20s and didn't go back, I don't think, until I was writing this book. So I knew I was writing this book and I knew it was set here. And a girlfriend and I I booked a trip and we stayed in this tiny cabin that I found on Airbnb and it became Anna's cabin in the book. I mean, just this tiny, it was so dark too, it's so <laughs> dark. And when the light comes in, even in the morning, it's not bright light because it's filtered through all of those trees and it's almost greenish and it's, it has this quality of like tea or something. It's just crazy. But we were hiking along the, the bluffs, um, which I talk about because Mendocino is a Victorian village. It looks like it's something right out of like Maine. It doesn't even look like California, just like these white clapboard shingles, beautiful Victorian houses perched on a bluff 
above the Pacific, like roaring Pacific, sheer cliff walls, like all of this drama surrounded by redwood forests. And then the fog comes in like this eerie coastal fog that can come in any moment, any time of day, any season, in fact. And we were hiking along the bluffs and uh, this girlfriend and I sort of slipped between two trees and suddenly we found ourselves in this grove where all the trees were twisted back on each other. And there was a plaque sort of saying how the process of the wind and the salt and the, the dramatic um, impact of the weather on the trees forces them back on themselves and twists them up. And I'm like, okay, if that is not a metaphor for life and for trauma, like speaking of drama, that was, did you hear that y'all, that thunder? We're in the middle of a thunderstorm here. Hopefully my computer won't die, but. I hope it doesn't freak my cat out. <laughs> Just have to roll with it around here. So. We will absolutely. <laughs> okay, um, so I wanted to ask you about your research for um, for this book, as opposed to how you research your historical fiction yeah. books. How was it different? Uh, and I hear that you actually had a retired detective help you with with some of the research. Yeah, yeah. So it was very different. So usually my process is I find the story or the story finds me and then I do a deep dive into the biography, the life, right? Because this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years is to find this, you know, little known woman, for, woman from history and, and sort of to make her life intimate. Yeah. And so in order to do that, I have to find the story within the story, like the deep story and the inner life and all and all of that. And so I read letters. I um, I sometimes travel to find, you know, certain locations and I and I find diaries and I do interviews. And so all of that is very different from what I did this time, which is to steep myself into true crime and um, and give myself a lot of nightmares. But along the way, I was put into touch with a retired detective who, again, it felt like a fluke um, encountering her, but she ended up being just the most amazing resource and such a gift to this book. Strangely, she was, she came of age as a detective in exactly the same time period, pre-DNA testing, pre-internet, pre-cell phone, and she dealt with intimate crimes just like Anna did and had this vast, deep source of knowledge and wisdom and also great kind of compassion and was willing to read the book multiple times and answer all of my questions and just really give me the kind of understanding from little things like I had a scene where Will and Anna arrived to interview Polly's, uh, not Polly's, uh, Cameron's parents for the first time. And it's raining. So I had Anna take off her shoes and Marianne, my detective, she's like, oh, no, 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 no. Cops never take their shoes off, <laughs> you know, not ever. And, you know, like different things like that, or like crime scenes or how to interview suspects or, um, or even how to interview witnesses. It was just fascinating fascinating and she's just she's just was been such a gift for me yeah lucky well um now i get to ask you about one of our favorite characters of the book is cricket cricket <laughs> which i love that the dog came into the story too like it, it, and just how she did was so great what how, what i guess what were you envisioning bringing bringing this pet to anna yeah, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I did an event in Pasadena and met up with another friend who grew up in Pasadena. This is in California and stayed at her sister's house, my friend's sister's house. And my friend's sister had the best dog ever. And I had this moment with this dog whose name was Cricket. And I was just getting started on this book and I had this moment and I looked into Cricket's eyes and I'm like, I think I have to put you in a book. <laughs> and my friend's sister is like, I, you know, I'm holding you to that, right? And for a while, it was just like a joke, like I'm going to put this dog in the book. And then the more I realized how Anna, she needed to learn to trust 
people again. And so maybe the way to get there would be to first trust this creature, right? who she never asks for and she really didn't deserve, but came along anyway. And I feel like my dog kind of is the same, right? And who saves me all the time, every day. And just that, just that relationship, the presence, that just like the physical presence of this animal, that's like a warm, solid, breathing, trustworthy, dependable, but, but intuitive and intelligent and all these things. Can you tell I'm a dog person? Um, and I just, I love their relationship. I love their partnership. And I, and the ending, which I won't give it away, um, came to me just by being in scene and knowing that Cricket belonged in that scene and that the drama would wrap around her relationship with this animal. And that just seems, I guess it sort of goes back to your point. There's a little bit of everything, right? Suddenly that just becomes part of the story. And I think that if you, I don't know, trust the nature of the story that you're telling to show you the way and for all of this to belong, mm -hmm. right, in this world, then it will, then it can belong. Then it doesn't feel like it's just some yard sale, right? That there's a purpose for all of these elements. And, and a lot of it is connected to things that are important to me. Somebody said, oh my God, so a great dog, and Rilke too, like you have poetry and, you know, redwood trees and a great psychic. And I'm like, yeah, all of those things, all yeah. of those things, because all of those things are kind of knitted in to things I'm interested in. I like, um, I, I have had this moment before, whenever the hippie told Anna, like, that's your dog. I have had moments where <laughs> the cat adopted me and I have suddenly we're part of each other's world. But that is, was really interesting to see Anna experience that when that's exactly what she needed. She yeah. needed someone to choose her and exactly. not have any- Exactly, in a way she doesn't really even have a choice, exactly. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I don't wanna move on from this book yet because I, I can almost get emotional. This book means so much to me. Oh, thank you. But I do want to know where are you taking us next? <laughs> Where are you taking us next? You know, I'm not exactly sure. I have a couple of ideas that I've written into and that's what I do when I'm trying to move on from the book. It's really interesting. Sometimes it's really difficult. The Paris Wife was super difficult to move on from because I was so enmeshed with those characters and so embedded in that world. And I think for this one, it's gonna be a while before I can you know, I'm really invested in that world and the place and the, you know, the people and I think about them still and I worry about them and I have an idea, you know, it's possible that I'll follow up and write another book set in this world with these characters. But I also love the idea, you know, this really interesting thing happened when this book came to me, which was that it blew off the ceiling of a decade's worth of work. And I didn't think that was going to be possible. And yet I started to have the time of my life. You know, you take a risk and suddenly you get rewarded. And what I'd like for my creative life and in my regular life, my everyday life, is to feel like I'm willing to take risks and see what happens. Because if we're going to keep growing and changing as people, then we have to say yes to a bunch. And I'm not exactly sure what's coming next, but um I'm hoping that I'm going to be brave again and and follow the story. I imagine it's strange. I think of um, being an author and you pour your whole life into a story, maybe even for years, and then you give it to a, a reader, and two days later they're finished with it and going, "Okay, what's next?" So much <laughs> oh, take a breath. <laughs> it takes years. Yeah. yeah, just take I a breath and read this one. But I, again, I just dearly love your writing and will read anything that you write. Oh, thank you so much. I, feel I would like to say as well as Christine who chimed in on the chat is that I do like Anna Hart. I would love to hear from her again. And so if there's ever, like I, I could envision a series involving Anna thank solving you. like crimes and all that kind of stuff. Does anybody ever approach you um, or your agent mentioned that could be a story. Yes, yes. 
So we do have, uh, it has sold to TV and it does have um, a producer that's developing it for television um, with the idea that it could be an extended series, in fact, because the book does suggest both backward and forward. Um, and and I, think it, I think it could be really fun to see these characters come to life. In fact, it would be wildly fun. Um, so we will, we will see, fingers crossed, that would be awesome, yeah. Well, we will be cheering you on, waiting to watch more of, of Anna Hart, watching the series, reading all your books. Thank you, um, thank you so much, Paula. Truly, Absolutely, y'all are delightful. And someday I would love to come to your store. In the meantime, I'm just super lucky to count you as fans, yes. supporters of my work. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, if you don't mind, we are gonna introduce our next book for next month. Of course. Um, to everyone, um, it is Haven Point by Virginia Hume. Um, Elizabeth and I read this book, loved it. There's so much to talk about. Um, I will put the links in the chat if you'd like to sign up um, and you can purchase it at Fables. We have lots of copies. Um, you can sign up on Zoom. We'll meet August, I think it's 10th. August 10th. Uh, yes, so we will be able to- And Virginia talk. will be will be joining us. We absolutely will. Oh, wow, look at that, fantastic. Well, thank you again, Paula. Have a wonderful- You're welcome, okay. Week. Bye. Be careful in that thunderstorm. That's oh, right. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.